Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I am going to be talking to you today about a story involving the gut microbiota, but I want to start off by telling you what my lab studies and how we very accidentally got interested in this. So um, we're interested in the basic idea that sensory receptors play important roles outside of what you would normally think of as sensory tissues. And what I mean by that are things like taste receptors and olfactory receptors, the smell receptors in your nose. We think of them as mediating the sense of taste and smell, but it turns out that they're really just really specialized chemical detectors. So if you think of them as specialized chemical sensors, you can imagine there's a lot of other places in the body that need to detect specific chemicals at specific times. And it turns out that taste receptors and olfactory receptors and nose receptors are also found in lots of other tissues where they play really interesting roles as chemical sensors. So we're interested in a role for um, these types of sensors in the kidney in particular because the kidney, because I'm trained as a renal physiologist, so um, I'm rather biased to the kidney anyway. But the kidney is also a main regulator of homeostasis in the body. It filters your entire blood volume many times per day, so it seemed to us if you wanted to have an inline chemical sensor system, the kidney might be a logical place to put it. So we're interested in looking at potential roles in the kidney. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is a particular olfactory receptor um, that's called olfactory receptor 78. They'll have really boring names, unfortunately. And a role that we think that is playing in the kidney um, with regards to helping to mediate blood pressure regulation. And this story is kind of interesting because we started out studying um, olfactory receptor 78 in the kidney, but we learned that we were um, actually studying the role of olfactory receptor 78 and how it interacted not only with the kidney, but with blood vessels and with the gut microbiota, or all the bacteria that um, live inside of you, or on your skin, and in different orifices. And actually, it turns out they play really important roles in interacting with the host physiology to change some things about how the host interacts. So when I talk about these gut bacteria, I'm referring to the fact that um, we are colonized by bacteria that live in our guts, the, the great majority of them in our guts, but as you can see on this slide, they're also um, on our skin, in our nasal and oral cavities, um, they're all over the place. There's also viruses and fungi as well. And it turns out that these aren't just passive passengers that are along for the ride. They actually play some really interesting roles where they interact with the physiology of the host, and there's actually a much more symbiotic relationship than we had appreciated previously. Um, I want to point out that this is a really new and emerging field, so you might have heard a lot about it um, recently, and we're starting to learn a lot about it, but there's a very much we don't know. And just to illustrate that, this is a graph of the um, number of papers per year published, um, scientific papers published in PubMed that have microbiota as a keyword. And you can see that this is largely flatlined until about 2011 or so when it has virtually exploded. So this is a really new and exciting area and we're starting to learn a lot of new things, but with this amount of information coming at us fast and furious, there's really a lot we don't know and there's a lot we haven't yet integrated together. Um, so what we do know is that microbial cells actually um, in, within our bodies outnumber the human cells by 10 to 1. The microbial genes outnumber the human genes by 100 to 1. And pretty much anything people have looked at to look for associations, it seems like there's always some sort of positive association with microbiota. If you look at different pathophysiological conditions or diseases, if you look at different healthy states, um, if you compare the microbiota of patients in these different categories, it seems like people can almost always find some sort of correlation, but the question is, um, is that causative? How are those things related? That's what we don't really understand yet because of the um, crazy upswing of that graph that's been really recent. So we're just beginning to understand the implications, um, that there's implications for the microbiota and lots of different diseases and conditions, but we really don't yet understand the mechanisms underlying those interactions or what that, what that really means or how that happens. And so that's something that um, our lab and a lot of other labs are now struggling with and, and trying really hard to get a better grip on. So with that as background, I'll tell you my story about olfactory receptor 78. So um, we originally found that this receptor was expressed in the kidney, and our question was, what is its physiological role? What is it doing there? And so we had two sub-questions that we were trying to answer that we thought would help us answer this big question. The first sub-question is, where exactly um, is this receptor localized? So we know it's in the kidney somewhere, but we really didn't know which specific cell type it was in, so we thought that was an important question to answer. 
And the second important question we wanted to answer was what is the receptor detecting? So unfortunately, most olfactory receptors are orphan receptors, and orphan means that we don't know where it, what it belongs to. So we wanted to know um, what it was detecting, because we thought if we knew what it was a receptor for, that would help us understand what it was doing. So these are the two questions that we set out to answer with the goal of ultimately understanding what the physiological role was. And um, I'm going to start by telling you about, um, we looked at the localization. So um, in order to look at the localization of this receptor, um, we used a, a mouse model where cells that would normally have this receptor can stain blue. So this is um, what we see in the kidney. This is a particular um, blood vessel. Um, this is where, let me see if I can point this out. So this is the afferent arterial, the renal afferent arterial, which is where the blood enters into the glomerulus. The renal glomerulus is a filtering unit of the kidney. So this is where your blood is filtered into the filtrate that will eventually become your urine. And the urine then travels down this tubule. The blood exits the glomerulus through the efferent arterial, which you can see doesn't stain blue at all. So the localization to the renal afferent arterial, believe it or not, got us really excited because in renal circles, this is actually a pretty famous vessel. This is where the hormone renin is primarily stored and secreted from, and renin is a the rate-limiting component of the renin angiotensin system, which David mentioned in his talk and is a really important regulator of blood pressure. Um, because we had this mouse model, we looked at a lot of other tissues to see what other cell types stain blue. And another main thing that we noticed was that vascular smooth muscle cells, so blood vessels in the prefer periphery and these small vascular beds seem to stain um, very strikingly for this receptor. So this is important because these blood vessels are a main place where the um, overall resistance is um, modified for your blood pressure regulation. And so if there's more resistance going through a tube, then the pressure will be higher. So the localization to these two places really caught our eye because these are two cell types that are classically known to be important in blood pressure regulation. So just based on the localization, we started to wonder if maybe this receptor could be playing a role in the regulation of blood pressure. So that um, deals with that first sub-question. Our second sub-question is what is the receptor a ligand for? What is it detecting? And as I mentioned, this is an orphan receptor. There's no known ligand. So we ran it through a series of screens to try to determine what, it, what the receptor was actually detecting. And when we did that, um, I won't bore you with the screen, but I'll show you the result. Um, using a lot of different screens, we found that it seems to detect two very specific compounds called acetate and propionate, which are shown here on this graph, but not um, any related compounds that we tested. We also cloned the human homolog. So this is a mouse receptor that we've been studying up till now, but we cloned the human version of the same receptor, ran it through the same screen, and got the same result. So the human and the mouse um, receptor both detect acetate and propionate. So we wondered, well, acetate and propionate are known to be short-chain fatty acids. That's a group of chemicals they're in. But what does that mean? Where do short-chain fatty acids come from? And why would a receptor in blood vessels want to be detecting them? So this is where we very accidentally fell into the microbiota, because when we looked in the literature, what we found very quickly is that, sorry, apparently part of this slide isn't showing, um, but this should show you um, that microbiota picture we saw before, whoops. Um, and the turns out the short-chain fatty acids are produced by your gut microbiota. So those bacteria that live in your intestine produce short-chain fatty acids, and those get absorbed into your bloodstream, and they're circulating in your body as a result of the metabolism of those gut microbiota. And this chemical then can activate this olfactory receptor. So in subsequent studies, what we found is that the gut microbiota produces short-chain fatty acids, and that it can then interact interact with this receptor in both of those places I talked about, both in that specific blood vessel in the kidney that regulates the secretion of a hormone, as well as in blood vessels in the periphery. And in both of these cases, in the end, what it's doing is it's increasing blood pressure. So it seems to be acting to support increases in blood pressure. Um, and looking into this further, we realized that there is another receptor for short-chain fatty acids that's also expressed in the peripheral vasculature. But it has the opposite effect. It seems to be working to decrease blood pressure. So the story, um, as often happens, got more complicated than we anticipated. So it turns out that these two receptors are kind of have a push-pull mechanism to help fine-tune blood pressure regulation. And the balance of short-chain fatty acid activation of these different receptors is one way that um, blood pressure can be fine-tuned. Now, um, lest I be 
accused of oversimplifying this for you, I want to point out that blood pressure regulation is classically known to be um, very complicated. Um, oh, sorry, I guess I have that slide next. Um, so some basic background about blood pressure and hypertension, first of all. So about a third of American adults have hypertension or high blood pressure, another, another third are prehypertensive. So this is um, a disease that affects a very large proportion of the um, of American population and, and worldwide as well. And one thing I wanted to point out is that for about 95% of um, hypertensives, they have what is known as essential hypertension, which means that um, we don't know what the cause of it is. So um, the sad joke is that um, essentially, we don't know why you're hypertensive, so we call it essential hypertension. Um, so if there's no known cause, people have looked at a lot of different things that seem to play important roles and, and, may, and may explain some of essential hypertension, but doesn't explain all of it. Some of them are listed here. So we wonder if maybe the gut microbiota are another potential thing that we should look at um, that hasn't yet been investigated very carefully. But this is another potential um, influence that could be regulating um, blood pressure in some of these patients. And in fact, in two really recent studies um, that came out just in, within the past month, they found that there are changes in the gut microbiota um, in two different rat models of hypertension, as well as in a small cohort of patients that have hypertension. So they're now looking in larger cohorts of patients um, to see if this holds true um, among a, a larger area. Um, so this is really potentially exciting. This is something that hasn't really been looked at before. And there's also some um, correlative data in the literature that people who tend to take probiotics, things that increase short-chain fatty acids, tend to have lower blood pressure. People that have lower short-chain fatty acid levels tend to have higher blood pressure. So um, there's some nice correlative data in the literature, but clearly um, we need to do a lot of work to tie that correlation together to see if they're really causative. So clearly a lot of future studies are needed here. And then finally, now I think I have the slide showing that blood pressure is quite complicated. Sorry, that was out of order. So this is a slide that Arthur Guyton um, very famously made in 1972. I think he published it in a journal and it's actually a fold out page. So he tried to, because it couldn't fit on one journal page. So he tried to diagram everything that regulates um, blood pressure. And you can see that it's this incredibly complicated circuit diagram. So um, we certainly don't understand all of this and we certainly don't completely understand how our story fits into here. But we think that maybe we've added a tiny little node onto Arthur Guyton's fine, um, famous diagram. And now we have to understand how that interacts with this larger system um, and how, um, how we might be able to play with the tiny little node that we found in order to change blood pressure regulation. So what I've shown you today is that short-chain fatty acid activation of two different receptors is a really novel pathway through which the metabolic production of your gut microbiota can affect the blood pressure of the host organism, which would be you and I. Um, with that, I'd like to thank people that are involved in the work, um, and I really wanted to especially point out funding and um, thank all of you. So we really depend on um, public support for um, NIH dollars, and I think that the press is a really important way that we um, have to try to continually um, convince the public that this is a really good use of their tax dollars. So we really appreciate all of your efforts in um, helping us communicate that to them so they understand what we're doing um, and that we're trying to um, really advance science and medicine. And with that, I'll um, thank you for your time.